Our guest today is Tom German. Tom published a book on the history of Santa Claus. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, it's called Santa Claus Worldwide. It starts in really prehistoric times and goes through pagan uh, gods that had ceremonies, at least theoretically had, had, had ceremonies of the winter solstice. And then it begins after Christianity to describe the different types of Santas that developed all over the world. I noticed that the book is very carefully documented with detailed footnotes and citations to sources. Isn't that unusual in a book like this? Historians and especially pop culture writers uh, tend not to document their sources. Uh, I spent 35 years as a lawyer, and a lawyer writing a brief for a court puts a, a, a citation after virtually every sentence. And so my view is, if you don't have the sentence there telling the reader uh, where you got that information, then it's not really very good. So I went through and made sure it was thoroughly documented. Isn't it a little strange to be talking about the accuracy of the history of Santa when most people over the age of, let's say, six or seven would probably tell you that Santa doesn't even exist? Santa, in my mind, and really I define him in the book as the uh, personification of Christmas or the Christmas spirit. And that clearly exists just as much as the American flag personifies the United States. It represents our country and Santa represents the festival of humanity as it's called by some authors. In researching your book, did you find any errors in the existing history? First of all, it's conventional wisdom that St. Nicholas was a fourth century bishop and that he was the original Christmas gift giver. In fact, there were Christmas gift givers who were pagan gods, such as Odin or Berkta, before St. Nicholas ever got involved. Another inaccuracy promulgated in the 1950s by a Berkeley history professor, Charles W. Jones, and he wrote a history in which he ventured that Santa Claus was actually um, created by the author Washington Irving. That got published, and for the next uh, 60 or 70 years, everybody who wrote about Santa copied what he said. But in fact, if you uh, look carefully at what Professor Jones did, he was working with the wrong edition of the book. So he was off, but in 70 years, uh, nobody seems to have noticed that, including some very distinguished history professors. Another inaccuracy that you'll find is the idea that Clement Clark Moore was the son of the president of Columbia College. And he wrote Night Before Christmas without a title, without any attribution in 1822. A year before Moore wrote his poem, there was a print shop just you know, yards literally from his winter home in southern Manhattan that published a book called The Children's Friend. And The Children's Friend had the entire story with illustrations. The knowledge that this book existed, which once you have the book, you can pretty clearly see that Moore copied it, was lost in history until the 1950s. The title of your book refers to St. Nicholas and other holiday gift bringers. Can you talk a little bit about some of those other holiday gift bringers? Going chronologically, um, we have the pagan gods. Saturn was the god who presided over Saturnalia, Yule in Northern Europe. Scandinavia had a god, Thor, who rode a chariot through the sky, pulled for who knows why, by two uh, goats. The goats became the gift givers in the Scandinavian countries until about the late 1800s when the elves and the gnomes 
known as Nisei and Tomten, got painted as Christmas figures. And you had Odin and Berkta were the pagan gods in northern Germany. Berkta would fly down the chimney into the home. She was the goddess of home and hearth, and she always had a broomstick with her. She would see whether the children were behaving and if they were, she'd give them a gift or a coin, and if they were not, she would take out their, their intestines and stuff them with uh, straw and pebbles and sew them back up. They were replaced by Christian figures, at least what they hoped would be Christian figures. Saint Nicholas is essentially Odin with a bishop's robe on. Now, Saint Nicholas always had an evil helper, or virtually always. These were basically satanic figures. They had animal parts like horns. They had, um, Krampus in particular had a tongue that was about this long and all red. And his job was to be the disciplinarian. People of Holland essentially created out of whole cloth a character named Sinterklaas. And Sinterklaas looked just like Saint Nicholas, but he was not a saint. He was just a guy who happened to live in Spain and who would come up every year and would uh, give gifts to the children, not on December 6th, which was Saint Nicholas Day, but on December 5th. And that's how they avoided the uh, prohibition on celebration of Saint Nicholas Day. The rest of Protestant Europe had the terror man or boogeyman. The one that was best known, though, is Knecht Ruprecht. And eventually those figures sort of came together in the form of a German gift giver named Weihnachtsmann. Uh, that means Christmas man in German. It then uh, started to develop more definite identity that Americans know as Pelsnickel or Belschnickel. Belschnickel actually immigrated to Pennsylvania along with Chris Kindle. That meant the Christ child. And the original idea was that all good things come from Christ. And so at Christmas time, gifts would be delivered by the Christ child. Someone figured out pretty quickly that, you know, using an infant didn't work as a delivery system. So uh, they recreated as the representative of Christ on earth, Chris Kindle. And she was a person in a long white dress and a wreath that went around with candles coming uh, out of the wreath. In Pennsylvania, however, the pronunciations were distorted, if you will. Somehow the understanding came that Belschnickel, the male gift giver, was actually known as Chris Kringle. And Chris Kringle was really the first really popular and definitive Santa Claus figure in the United States. In the 1840s, he had three books about him. It wasn't until the 1860s that people started to use Santa Claus in lieu of St. Nicholas when they were telling the uh, poem Night Before Christmas. There are um, a whole variety of gift givers that are basically variations of the ones I've just talked about. What were the most important insights that you gained in writing the book? One insight um, that I thought was important was that no one invented Santa Claus. He evolved from prehistoric times, through pagan times, through the Middle Ages, through modern times, uh, really without anybody's help. A second insight that I gained was that Christmas is not a day, it is a season. People tend to think of Christmas as the uh, date Jesus Christ was born on December 25th, which was never the day he was born, but put that aside. Uh, in fact, Christmas has always been something that started with an agricultural festival in November or December. The Romans called it Saturnalia. We call it Thanksgiving. 
Um, you go through when you have the sun god in ancient times, Jesus Christ in more modern times, have a birthday celebration. You then have a New Year's celebration that was in Roman times called Calends. And that's how you have this, uh, you know, four or five week celebration in Rome. And we really have that same celebration in our own lives. We just don't get all those days off. Uh, but I think that's an important thing to remember. Can you talk a little bit about why celebrating the winter solstice and now celebrating the Christmas season is so important for the psyche of people? The ancient pagans who celebrated the, the winter solstice, for them, uh, midwinter was a terrifying time. The sun seemed to be disappearing. All of the plants seemed to be dying. The cattle that, that were raised couldn't be kept over the winter because it was too expensive in terms of grain to feed them. So they had to be slaughtered. And, and most importantly, it got cold and it got dark and it got very scary. I mean, in the, the northernmost parts of Europe, uh, the winter solstice is not the shortest day. It's the middle of a month long night and there's no lights, there's no modern entertainment. But what they did have was they had free time because they couldn't do anything. They had the beer and the wine and the mead that they had made with the fruits of the harvest. They had fresh meat for about the only time all year. They had the ability to decorate with evergreens and they had um, friends and family and a desire to enjoy themselves by feasting, dancing, singing. And so they were able to create this festival and turn what would have been the most terrifying part of the year into the happiest part of the year. Now, if you bring that forward 2,000 years, it's more similar than you might think. Thanksgiving is sort of launched us into uh, the Christmas season. From there, we spend the next uh, three or four weeks preparing. You then have two to three weeks of celebration, the feasting, the drinking, the, the visiting, the presents, all of that. And then by the time you're done with the whole thing, you're in the middle of January. At that point, it's actually starting to get lighter again, starting to get warmer again. The Christmas season allows us basically to take that three months of dark, awful weather and nothing to do and to make it the best time of the year. It's, it's ingenious. Thank you so much, Tom, for sharing your insights with us today. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it.